Welcome to the deep and haunting story of the Dyatlov Pass incident, one of the eeriest mysteries of the 20th century. It's a tale that begins with adventure, but ends in explicable tragedy, with more questions than answers. Imagine this, nine young hikers set off into the Russian wilderness in 1959, full of life and excitement, ready to conquer the snow-covered peaks of the Ural Mountains, but none of them would ever return. What happened in those dark, frozen woods? Let's dive into this chilling story and try to uncover the truth behind the Dyatlov Pass incident. In January 1959, 10 experienced hikers, mostly students and graduates from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, prepared for an expedition into the Ural Mountains of Soviet Russia. They were led by a 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov, a determined and well-seasoned leader who had previously led numerous similar expeditions. But this one was much different. This wasn't any old hike. It was a trek across one of the most challenging routes in the region. Planned to reach Ototen, a mountain whose name eerily enough means don't go there in the indigenous Mansi language. The team was a mix of strong young explorers, aging from 22 to 38. All young and in the prime of their life, and all thirsting for adventure and discovery, but what they discovered was more than they bargained for. On January the 27th, the group set off from the town of Vizhai, the last inhabited settlement before the wilderness. The hike started well, but by January the 28th, Yuri, one of the team members, unfortunately fell ill and had to turn back, unknowingly saving his life. Waving goodbye to his friends, Yuri could never have imagined it would be the last time he'd see them alive. As the nine remaining hikers continued their journey, they moved deeper into the frozen landscape, documenting their progress with photographs and diary entries. The entries were cheerful and full of optimism, despite the biting cold and the increasing difficulty of the trek. February 1st, 1959. We woke up to a calm morning today, the sun barely peeking over the horizon, casting a soft glow over the snowy landscape. The cold is biting, but we're all in high spirits. Yuri cracked a few jokes to get us laughing as we packed up our camp. It's funny how a bit of laughter can make the cold seem a little less harsh. Today, we set our sights on reaching the pass. The trek is challenging, but I can feel our group growing closer with every step. We trudge through thick snow and icy wind, each of us lost in our thoughts as the quiet of the wilderness surrounded us. Every so often, someone would start singing a song, and we'd all join in, our voices echoing through the trees. We had a brief scare this afternoon when Lyudmila slipped on some ice and twisted her ankle. She insisted it was nothing and, thankfully, after a quick rest, she seemed fine to continue. It's moments like these that remind us how isolated we are out here and how much we rely on one another. Igor, as always, kept a watchful eye on all of us, making sure we stayed together and that everyone was doing okay. By late afternoon, the weather began to turn. The wind picked up and snow started falling heavily, making it difficult to see. We decided to set up camp a bit earlier than planned. It took some effort to pitch the tent in the strong wind, but we managed. Once inside, the warmth of our little stove was a welcome comfort. Tonight, we cooked a modest meal of bread and tinned meat, sharing stories and laughter as the snow continued to fall outside. The wind is howling now, making the tent shudder, but we are safe and warm inside. This part is where the story takes a turn. On February the 1st, 1959, the group made their final camp on the slopes of Kolat Sikal, a barren mountain whose name ominously translates to Dead Mountain. It was a desolate place with winds howling through the night and temperatures plunging well below freezing. Instead of seeking shelter in the nearby forest, they inexplicably chose to set up their tent on the open slope of the mountain. Some believe that they wanted to practice camping on the slope, Others think they were simply too tired to move any further. What happens next remains a mystery even to today. Days turned into weeks and no word came from the group. Families and friends waited, 
growing increasingly anxious as the silence stretched on. It's like they just disappeared out of nowhere, and no one knew where they were. Eventually, on February the 20th, a search party was organised, initially with volunteers, and later joined by the Soviet military, as the situation became more and more desperate. After days of searching, on February the 26th, the searchers stumbled upon a chilling sight. The hiker's tent, half buried in snow, torn open from the inside. The searchers initially assumed there was something wrong with the tent or they just abandoned their things. But once they looked inside the tent, they noticed it was filled with the hiker's belongings. Their boots, clothes and even food as if they had left in a rush. But why on earth would they leave the safety of their shelter in such a hurry into the deadly cold of the night, with temperatures well below freezing? Feeling anxious but somewhat relieved that they managed to find trace of the group, the searchers followed the trail which led them towards the edge of a nearby forest, about 1.5 kilometres away. However, there, under a large cedar tree, they found the first of the bodies. Two men, both named Yuri, were lying near the remains of a small fire. They were dressed only in their underwear, their bodies showing signs of severe frostbite clinging to the back of a cedar tree with their hands bruised and blooded as if they tried desperately to climb the tree. What were they running from and why weren't they wearing any clothes? Completely shocked by what they saw, the searchers could only carry on their search to try and find some survivors. However, as the search continued, more bodies were found scattered in the snow. Igor Dyatlov, the group leader, was discovered lying face up in the snow, his arms crossed over his chest as if shielding himself from something. Another was found next to him, face down in the snow, her head pointing towards the tent, a position that suggested she was trying to return to safety. A few moments later, one of the members of the search team shouted to the leader and more bodies were discovered. One of the bodies had its skull fractured, a wound that could have been fatal, but there were no signs of external trauma. Even more disturbing and weird, one of the women was found with her tongue missing. Her eyes gouged out and a strange orange hue to her skin. And lastly, two other bodies were discovered, under several feet of snow, as if they had been placed there deliberately. What on earth could have caused these horrific injuries? Why were some dressed in only their underwear? while others had managed to put on more clothes. Even wearing pieces of clothing that didn't belong to them, it made no sense whatsoever. The investigation that followed only deepened the mystery. The autopsy reports were inconclusive and just bizarre. Some of the hikers had died from hypothermia, while others had suffered severe internal injuries comparable to a car crash, yet with no visible external wounds. The tongue and eyes missing from the woman's body led to wild speculations, some suggesting animals had scavenged her body, but others pointed out that the injuries were too precise and not consistent with an animal attack. Adding to the mystery, radiation was discovered on some of the hikers' clothing, leading to theories of secret military experiments or UFO encounters. Others even suggested a Yeti encounter. Locals reported seeing strange orange spheres in the sky around the time of the incident, fueling rumours of paranormal activity. Some speculated that the hikers had stumbled across a secret military test site and were silenced for what they had witnessed. Others believed they were victims of natural phenomena, such as infrasound waves, that drove them to panic and flee their tent. But all of this is just speculation. The Soviet authorities closed the case quickly, stating that the hikers had died due to an unknown compelling force. But what could that have been? An avalanche was ruled out because there was no signs of one, and the tent was still partially standing. A snow slab theory suggested a block of snow may have collapsed onto the tent, causing the panic. But still, this didn't really explain the bizarre injuries or why the group split up and headed in different directions. Years have passed on, and while numerous theories have emerged from the plausible to the absurd, none have been able to explain all the facts. The Dyatlov Pass incident remains one of the most perplexing cold cases in modern history. What were those orange orbs in the sky? 
Why did they flee their tent in such a rush? And who or what inflicted such terrifying injuries on them? To this day, the Dyatlov Pass, named in memory of the group's leader, remains a place of mystery. Some say the mountain still holds the spirits of the nine hikers forever, forever wandering in search of the answers that eluded them in life. The case is closed, but the question remains, echoing across the frozen wilderness of Kalot Sikal. If you ever find yourself in the Urals, remember the tale of the nine young souls who ventured into the mountains seeking adventure, only to encounter something beyond their understanding. What happened on that fateful night in 1959? Perhaps it's a mystery that's best left unsolved. So, what do you think truly happened at Dyatlov Pass? Was it a tragic incident, a sinister secret, or something otherworldly? Let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed my video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.